first 10 verses. If you're using a Bible that's uh, in the pew there, it's probably around about page 241 in the New Testament section. So towards the end of our Bibles, page 241. Ephesians chapter 2 and beginning verse 1. In the past, you were spiritually dead because of your disobedience and sin. At that time, you followed the world's evil way. You obeyed the ruler of the spiritual powers in space, the spirit who now controls the people who disobey God. Actually, all of us were like them and lived according to our natural desires doing whatever suited the wishes of our own bodies and minds. In our natural condition, we, like everyone else, were destined to suffer God's anger. But God's mercy is so abundant, and his love for us is so great, that while we were spiritually dead in our disobedience, He brought us to life with Christ. It is by God's grace that you have been saved. In our union with Christ Jesus, he raised us up with him to rule with him in the heavenly world. He did this to demonstrate for all time to come the extraordinary greatness of his grace in the love he showed us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It's not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. God has made us what we are. And in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good deeds, which he has already prepared for us to do. Amen. Two or three specially uh, trained people would turn up and knock on somebody's door. And over the next couple of days, they would do a complete makeover of their back garden. Be nice, wouldn't it? Instead of being a jungle overgrown, rocks all over the place, weeds infesting it, now you have beautiful flat lawn, an ornate pathway down the middle, flower beds down one side, a shed at the bottom for the children's toys, and maybe a swing for them to play on. It was called ground force. It brought a a makeover to the garden. And as people sometimes, we like a little bit of a makeover, don't we? So we we, we go on a diet, try and lose a little bit of weight and change a little bit of our shape. Maybe some people go for a bit of plastic surgery, a little nip and tuck here or there, to make the face look a little younger than it is. But perhaps we we change uh, our, our hairstyle. Or maybe we get a new wardrobe. And we create, we say, a new image. That's what it is. A new image. Something different on the outside. Doesn't really touch us or transform us within. By contrast... Uh, I forgot to move these on, didn't I, and show you a picture of a transformed garden. But by contrast, uh, the uh, Intel, largest uh, commu- uh, manufacturer of uh, computer chips, those things inside your computer that do the work, they were saying, don't worry so much about what it looks on the outside. Don't worry if it's stylish or sleek or, or the in colour. It's what's inside that counts. You probably can't actually read that on it, but that's what it says. It's what's inside that counts. And we know that well, as we read the scriptures, God looks not just at what is on the outside, not just whether their hair is tidy and the shoes have been polished, but what is inside. God looks at the heart. 
The Bible says to us that the heart is sinful and deceitful. And Paul would agree. And in fact, he takes three verses at the beginning of chapter 2 to to describe that inside. But then he comes to the most wonderful transformation. A transformation that completely outshines ground force or changing rooms or, or anything we may do with the body. And it's all down to the love, the mercy, and the grace, and the kindness of God. And so this morning we're going to begin with the transformation, that we are transformed in Christ. And the first thing that Paul says there that is that in Christ we are made alive. Now actually we don't find that until verse 5. Because verses 1 and 3, Paul is describing for us what we were before God got his hands on us and began to work. It's not a pretty picture. It doesn't flatter us at all. Paul says we were dead, we were slaves, and we were condemned. And the reason that Paul takes three verses to to describe that before he comes to God's transformation is because the more we understand what we were, the more we remember what we were, the more we will appreciate what God has done. The more we will be grateful to it. And Paul emphasizes that before and after. He uses a little word that says, at that time, or at one time. All of us are included within that category. Dead in sin. Slaves to it. And condemned. And then he says, but God. At the end of that long description in verses 1 to 3, verse 4 opens up with those couple of wonderful words, but God. God got in on the picture. And God transformed something that was a mess to be something that is now really beautiful. God made us alive with Christ. But what does Paul mean, though, when he says that we were once dead? I mean, surely the very fact that we all sat here, eyes are open, we're breathing, means that we're far from dead, we're alive and kicking. Well, mind the person next to you, but we're alive. Paul there isn't talking about the body. He's not even talking really about our our thinking or our emotions. He's saying that we were dead in our sins. And he uses two words for that. The first word is a, a word that means to take a step off the pathway. So God has shown us the right path on which to walk and we step off it. The other word he uses is a word that means we we miss the mark. It's sort of like taking a a picture from from, from sport where you're trying to hit a target. Only somehow we miss. And it doesn't matter whether we miss by an inch or by a mile, we miss. And so it is that God says to us, don't lie, don't steal, don't become angry with others. Rather, he says, be kind, be compassionate, be forgiving. And the thing is, when we do the things that God says don't do, or when we don't do the things that God calls us to do, it's not just that we make a little slip. It's not just that we have a little fail. It's actually, we are living in the opposite way to all that God is. God says, don't lie, because he's the God who always speaks the truth. God says, be kind and compassionate, because that's his heart. And so if we are living in the opposite way to what God is, that means that we are away from God. We are separated from God. The Bible says that to be separated from God is so serious that it's to be dead. To be dead in our sins. Now, we may not like that description. We may want to protest about it, but 
That's how the scripture puts it. Having turned away from God, refusing to listen to God, doing our own thing, is simply to be dead in our sins. To be without God, and as Paul says, without hope in this world. But, he says, if once we will see that, if once we will acknowledge that's where we have been, now we can see that first of all, in Christ, we are made alive. And that's three little Greek words all put together to create one wonderful picture. It's the little word sun, which means with, the verb zao, which means to live, and another verb poio, which means to make. So putting those together, what Paul is saying is God made us to live again in Christ. Once we were dead, now we are alive in Christ. And theologians sometimes speak of regeneration to describe this. It's describing an amazing and fantastic work of the Spirit of God within us, because it's what's inside that counts. His amazing work within to give us a new life. That we should be born again. Not simply born a second time, repeating all the same mistakes, but born again, born in a a whole new way. And so sometimes the scripture talks of a new heart or of a new spirit, even of having a new nature. And so we are made alive with Christ. But not only are we made alive in Christ, we're also raised up with Christ. And I was reflecting on this this week and wondering, what is, is different? What is Paul adding here? And my thoughts took me to the story of Jairus and his daughter who had died. And that moment when Jesus and and Jairus and the mother and and three of the disciples go in to the little room where the girl is. And Jesus doesn't just speak to give her new life. He takes her by the hand and lifts her up. And I thought, that's it. That must have been such a wonderful moment. All the tears would have gone. All the pain would have been removed. Now just great joy because the little girl is living and she's up and about again. I thought, so it is. Christ comes. Not only speaks life into us, takes us by the hand and raises us up again. Not just for a few months or maybe for a few years but forever. God raises us up from an old way of life to a brand new way of living in the power of the Spirit. If you think back, did sin once weigh you down? No longer, because the burden has been taken away and the scripture says you have been raised up. You remember a moment or a time when guilt perhaps filled your heart. There was no way of of, of getting it out. But that too has changed. Now you're free. And you have been raised up to live in a new way. To live a transformed life. In the fear and the love of God. In the joy of his presence in the assurance of his love and his acceptance. And so raised up to live in that new way, the way of kindness, the way of forgiveness, the way of gentleness, because surely that's a new way. Surely that's a higher level and way to live. But still Paul hasn't finished. He says we're made alive in Christ, we've been raised up with Christ, And then he says, and now we are seated with Christ. If you're sat in an aeroplane and it's flying at 30,000 feet, above the clouds in the glorious sunshine, where are you? You're also at 30,000 feet, aren't you? Thankfully, you're not actually flying, you're safe inside the plane. But that's the point. We are raised and seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. 
Now, in chapter 6 and verse 12 of Ephesians here, Paul will talk about all kinds of spiritual powers and forces of evil that are in the spiritual or in the heavenly realm. It's the thought that uh, these forces live in the atmosphere or in the air above the earth and exercise their influence over people. And even here in chapter 2, he describes Satan as the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Now the point was that such evil forces had exerted their influence in the lives of the Ephesian people. They had been slaves to the goddess Diana. And they didn't know any other way. And what Paul is saying to them is, this has also changed. After all, where is Jesus? Where is Jesus right now? Is he not raised and exalted to the highest place? Did we not see that that illustration of the power of God that is toward us is a power that raised him and seated him far above all rule and authority and power? So if you are in Christ, and that's what it is to be a Christian, a disciple, we are in Christ. If that's where he is, where are you? In the same place, absolutely. Now, okay, the body may be here on earth. There may be a life to be lived here on earth. But we live in the spiritual realm. We have a spiritual life. And that spiritual life is to be lived, seated with Christ in the heavenly places. What it means is that no demon, no power of evil can control you. No power of evil can destroy you. No power of evil anywhere at any time can ever separate you again from God. Because you are safe in Christ. Seated with him where he is above all of those. Now and for eternity. Now, we do absolutely, somebody said praise God, amen. Now, there needs to be some care in how we apply that sometimes seems to be quite popular to raise our voices and to shout at the devil and tell him where to get lost, as it were. I think we need to be a little careful in how we do that. He is indeed under Christ. His power does not begin to compare with the power of Christ. But the devil is still a lot stronger than you or I. You can go and play, yes. Right? He's still stronger than we are. And our safe place is not in shouting at the devil. Our safe place is where we are in Christ. We are seated with him in the heavenly places. And the fourth thing that Paul says about us at this point is that in Christ, we are God's Workmanship. Well, God has been at work in us. Now, if we are God's workmanship, I reckon that makes us a masterpiece. Don't you? Individually and together. That's what we'll look at next week. That masterpiece that God has created us in putting us together as his family. But on Monday evening, Andrew and I went and and we visited a couple of folks. And uh, in the second home, we had some tea and some coffee, which was great. But as tea and coffee was being brought, a a low coffee table was moved closer to where we were sitting. And it was some table. It had been specially made. It was handcrafted. You could see the grain of the wood. and, And the carving on the top was beautiful. It really was quality workmanship. And you are God's quality workmanship. I don't know what you think of when you think of uh, a masterpiece. Maybe you think of uh, the Sistine Chapel, painted over I don't know how many months by Michelangelo. Quite some achievement. Or maybe you think of uh, one of uh, a number of, of, of famous 
uh, statues or sculptures like Rodin's The Thinker. Or maybe you think of a, a jewel, a gem that has been beautifully crafted. But they don't compare with God's workmanship. If God looked at us in the first creation, looked at men and women whom he had made and said, that is good. In fact, with human creation, that is very good. Now, if that's what God said then, what do you think God says when he looks at us, his new creation? You know, I'm looking at some pretty fine masterpieces right now. Some real gems of God's working. In fact, why don't you just turn to the person beside you or in front of you, tap them on the shoulder and say to them, you are a masterpiece of God's grace. Go on, say it to the person who's nearest to you. You are a masterpiece of God's grace. Okay, you can tell some others at the end of the service. This is that transformation of God. He has made us alive. He has raised us up. He has seated us with Christ, and we are his masterpieces. Now, we are to live like that. This is how we are to think of ourselves. You know, you may come today, and you've just about made it because of the aches and the pains that you live with. You may not be looking forward to what you face tomorrow morning when you go into work, but Take with you the fact that you've been made alive in Christ. You've been raised up to live new. You are with Christ in the heavenly realms and you are his masterpiece. And one day he's going to finish it off completely. But why should God do that? Let's have a look at some of these uh, wonderful words that describe for us the character of God. Love, mercy, grace, and kindness. Now, I don't want to, it, it, it's a little bit like, see, having a beautiful cake in front of you. And then somehow you try and pull it apart and separate the flour from the margarine and the sugar and the cocoa if it's a chocolate one, you know. Or it's like you, you see a, a beautiful cross stitch that somebody's done and you just try and unpick it and separate the strands out. And I don't want us to do that. But I do want us to try to understand a little of these four words that are just so packed full of wonder. that We might see this is why and how God does that transformation. Now, the first word that Paul uses in chapter 2 is actually to speak of God's mercy. Now, there's a reason that he does that. It's because it is the mercy and the grace and the kindness of God that brings about that transformation. However, the source of that mercy and grace is the love that is in the heart of God. Without that love, there would be no mercy and no grace. So we'll begin with God's love because that's the source of everything else. And Paul describes it as great love or much love. And I say that it's the love of God that is the source of mercy and grace. Because I want to say to you, it's not the love of God that saves us. Now, before you throw me out as a heretic, hear how I want to explain that. What I mean is, God doesn't forgive you just because he loves you. God doesn't just sort of love you and say, oh, never mind, doesn't matter really, we'll we'll, we'll start again. But it's the love of God. That's something that is at the very heart of who and what God is. That moves God to act with mercy and with grace. So let me try and illustrate that. Uh, You know very well the verse in in John 3 that says that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the mercy, the grace, because that's what God has done. But the question is, why has God done that? And you know the answer, because you know full well that I've missed the first verses. 
at the first words of that verse. God loved the world. And so he gave. The giving is the expression of his grace and his mercy. But it's the love of God that moves God, if we can say that, to act in that kind of way. So it's because of his love that we receive the riches of his mercy. Now, sometimes it's easy. If the passage only talks about mercy, then we can talk about that. Sometimes it may only talk about grace. But when you've got both of them together, what's the difference? Maybe mercy is that God does not treat us as we deserve. But grace... Is God positively giving us something that we don't deserve? So mercy is God doesn't treat us as we do deserve. But grace is God is showing his favour to us in a way that we can never earn or merit. And we're told here about the riches of his mercy. It means that there's a wealth of riches. There's an abundance of riches. It's a little bit like Job with his many fields, his many cattle, his many sheep, his many pieces of gold, his many grains in the barn. But they don't compare with the riches of God's mercy. But it's in Jesus that God, as it were, opens the windows of heaven and pours his mercy upon us. And so it is that David, in his great prayer, that Psalm 51, begins, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your abundant mercies. Actually, what he says is, blot out my transgressions. But what he's asking is that God should not treat him as he deserves. Because that's the mercy of God. Then Paul talks about the incomparable, there's that word again, incomparably, incomparable here, riches of God's grace. It means that there's no lack, there's no shortage, there is enough and even more. Because the scripture shows us here, it is by grace that we are saved. It's grace that forgives us. It's grace that sets us free. It's grace that makes us alive. It's grace that raises us up. God's favour. God decides to do good to us. And that grace, says Paul, is incomparable. It's a wonderful Greek word, hupa and balon. Paul loves to put two or three words together in order to try and get us to see the amazing grace of God. But the word hooper means over, and the word ballo means to throw. And you know, I love playing uh, cricket. Now what happens is if somebody hits the ball, hopefully the fielder stops it before it gets to the edge of the field. And if he does or she does, you pick it up and you throw it back into the person called the wicket keeper because they're standing there with a pair of gloves on so it makes it easier to catch the ball. But if you throw it too high or too hard, where's the ball going to go? It's going to go way over the top of the keeper's head. Even if they jump, they won't be able to reach it. And that's what Paul's saying. The grace of God just throws itself over. It goes over every sin and beyond. There is nothing that you have done that cannot be blotted out and covered by this incomparable grace of God. And when Paul writes Romans, he he puts it this way. At the end of chapter 5, he says, when sin abounded, or when sin increased, that is, when sin got more and more and more and more, what then? Ah, he says, grace abounds even more. So if sin abounds and increases and mounts up, the grace of God can be thrown over the whole lot of it. Isn't that good news? The incomparable riches of God's grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ means that God is generous. 
means that God treats us well. It means that God blesses us. But did you know one last thing? Probably you didn't because the uh, Good News Bible doesn't put it in these kind of words. It simply says that uh, God has created us for a life of good deeds, which he already prepared for us to do. Now, the interesting thing is, literally would be that God prepared for us to walk in. That takes us back to verse 1. You were dead in your sins in which you once walked. In other words, that was your way of life. But now, made alive in Christ, raised up with Christ, seated with Christ, being God's masterpiece, we are now to walk in a completely different way. We are to walk in the good works that God has for us to do. So where can you treat someone with kindness this week? Who could that be? And how will you show it to them? Where can you forgive someone this week? Is there someone you need to forgive? And how can you do that? Where can you be merciful this week? To whom can you show mercy? And how will you do it? Because God has transformed us in Christ. We are his masterpiece in order that we too may do good things. May God help us to do so. Amen.